Let's open our Bibles to the 90th Psalm. And this is a unique Psalm. Something special about this one amongst the Psalms. We have been uh, walking through. We have one more week where uh, we'll be uh, singing our way through the Psalms. And next week, as we start prepping for walk through the Bible, we will spend our day in the 119th Psalm next Sunday. Next Sunday, because... It's the week before we start walk through the Bible, and the 119th is all about God's Word. It's a powerful message uh, about God's Word and why it's important for us to spend time in it. Now, we've been working on the Old Testament. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to challenge you on an Old Testament story. You think you could tell someone the story of Job? You think you could have a simple explanation for Job? We remember Job is a successful guy. He's rich. He's influential. And in a day, through a series of disasters, it all unravels and everything goes bad for Job. And he's left at the end of the day with a couple of things. He's still got, he's still got his life, but it's a tough life. And he's still got his wife, and she's a tough old bird too. <laughs> you remember, she's, she's quoted once that what she says to her, her beloved husband this is her encouragement in the midst of his sorrow and grief and sickness and hurt and pain. Job, curse God and die. Well, thanks. Appreciate that. Or the other time, uh, Job references her and he says, uh, I've got this problem and this problem and this problem and my breath is offensive to my wife. You, know, you just never know why God gives you a gift. And uh, Job probably thought about that a lot during this time of his life. Yeah, you remember what happened. Job is in the depths of his grief and his pain and his suffering. And the Bible says he has some friends and they come and they just sit with him. And uh, that's sometimes the, the ministry of presence is the best thing you can do for someone in a time of great pain and hurt. And finally, Job starts to talk, and he starts asking questions. I, I just don't know, and well, the Bible's filled with these questions. The big why question, why has this happened? I, I don't understand where God is in this, and, and how it's come to this point, and why God ha has allowed these things, and God, have you forgotten me? And he, so he's just calling out to God. Well, suddenly... These friends of his who've been so supportive in sitting with him in his pain, uh, they start talking too. And they start telling him, well, Job, here's the thing you don't understand. And Job, see, here's how God does stuff. Here's who God is and how God works. And the rest of the book is Job's responding to what they say. And they take turns telling him how God, here's how God is, here's what God's about, here's how God does stuff, and here's what you don't understand about yourself or God, and it's a back and forth, back and forth until God settles the whole thing when God speaks and everyone gets really quiet in the story. What you find from Job's friends is a common problem we see today. Easy answers to complex things. Easy answers to big questions about God and what God is up to. And what they started sharing was their opinion about God. Well, see, here's how I think of God. Here's how I think God does stuff. Here's what I think God is doing. And they start throwing out their opinions. Everybody's got lots of opinions about God. Uh, and maybe that's a big G and maybe that's a small G, but it's a God, God story. And isn't it easy to offer up answers to difficult questions for everybody else when it's not, it's not you that's struggling, you that's suffering, you that's in pain. But here's what God says about these guys and all their big opinions about him in this book of Job. Job 42. After the Lord had finished speaking to Job, he said to Eliphaz, who's kind of the leader of that group of friends, the, the Timonite, I am angry with you and your two friends, for you have not spoken accurately about me as my servant Job has. You give me a lot of opinions, but you don't know me. You don't understand me, and you're saying things you do not understand. You do not grasp. 
To say that it's important for us to understand God would be a pretty big understatement today, right? To say it's important to know God, to understand God, to, to see God as He is. Because here's what happens. We exchange the God of the book for a lesser God, for a, for a scaled-down model of God. And that's what idolatry is. You know, one of the Ten Commandments says this, The Lord declares, You shall have no other gods before me, you shall not make for yourself an idol or a likeness of what is in heaven above or on earth beneath or in the water under the earth. You shall not worship them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children, on the third and fourth generations of those who hate me. There are a lot of misconceptions about who God is and what he is about. And the reality is, your perspective on God is going to color everything about your life. What's important and what's not, the choices that you make, the life that you live, it's going to affect the core of who you are. And I think this through. If how you view God is skewed, inaccurate, twisted up, distorted, oh my. Your entire worldview is messed up. I don't know where you get your worldview. Some people get it from their favorite news outlet. They get it from social media. They get it from whatever mama and daddy always said. They get it from their peer group. We get our worldview from a lot of different places. But if you don't know God and you don't understand God, you end up like, like Job's friends who, who missed the boat completely and landed on the wrong side of God happens all the time uh, one of the things uh, you probably should they're not the outline yet but you might write, write this down everybody have their pen ready you need to write this down you really need to record this this is great wisdom truth God is God everybody got it God is God on the other side of that I am not and you are not and you need to see both of those things It may surprise you to learn that this, that, that particular commandment from the Ten Commandments is the most repeated of the Ten Commandments. The verses that use the words idol or idolatry occur 220 times in the Scriptures. It, it is the, it's the most prominent declared sin in the Bible, substituting something for who God really is. Distorting a view of God, substituting a job description for God other than how God has made himself known. God has revealed himself in his eternal word. And that uh, is what we call sin. And it's really the core of so much of, of our sin. An idol is anything that takes the focus off of God and puts it on something else. And not just, well, the God I believe, well, let me tell you what I, not the God, not your made up God. The God of the Bible, anything that takes your focus off of the one true God. Anything else that's first in your life. Well, you know, we always say, oh, God's first in my life. Yet you have no way of proving that in any court of law. Anyone who followed you around for 10 minutes would say, that is not, that cannot even be close to true. That, that's when we have drifted into idolatry. And that's why it gets so much press in God's word. Anything that's not God is an idol, even if it's a good thing. And what does it mean to idolize something? It means you just value it more than God. Here's God, but you're, you're operating with a dumbed-down version of him that you uh, kind of manage on your own. God says for our own good, don't idolize anything or anyone. The potential list is endless. Power, popularity, uh, our stuff, education, yourself, careers, Hobbies, power, friendship, anything that you're looking to, say, this is where I find my significance. This is where I find my value. This is where I find my purpose in life. This is where I find my happiness. This is, this is what I'm, I'm going to spend this one and only life God has entrusted to me. This is going to get the best of it and the most of it. Any of those things that's not God, as he's revealed himself in his word, that's an idol. It's a substitute. Stuart Briscoe said an idol takes the place of God. A thing that pushes aside all thought of putting God's laws first or conforming to the Bible's teaching. 
uh, comes to be set up in our hearts, and these are idols of the heart. We're not talking about, I have a little carved image you know, on, my, you know, on my dresser that I worship. That's not much of our idolatry in our culture is that, though we find those things here and around the world. It's something in our hearts. How do we create our idols? Well, here's the thing about idolatry, and this is true, again, as we're, as we're gearing into uh, walk through the Bible, I've been plowing through the Old Testament and looking at this theme as it runs through the Old Testament. And what I find is, and just finished the sermon this last week on the period of the divided kingdom, uh, where there's a northern kingdom and a southern kingdom, uh, Judah in the south, Israel in the north, and they didn't ever stop worshiping God. They just added to. They enhanced. They expanded. Oh, yes, we still worship God. We'll still, we'll still do the feast days. We'll still do some of these laws. thing is, we've upgraded to God 2.0. We've, we've, we've made him better. We've added, we've synch syncretism. That's the, that's the biggest false teaching in the world. It's the God of the Bible plus whatever happens to be on my mind, on my heart, in my affections today. We shrink him down. We redefine him. We limit his influence, authority, involvement. We limit what he actually says, what he actually meant. And we create a God of our own convenience. He's kind of like, uh, again, conversations we have about God this, this comes up all the time it comes up inside churches and outside churches God's like a puppy that follows you around and uh, you just tell him you, you go on with your life and you, you just tell him hey you need to do this hey you need to do that and that's how we relate to God God I, I need this God I need you to take care of that God I need you to fix this problem okay now I'm going to go on with my agenda my life my stuff this little image, self-serving, self-affirming, that's what sin does. What I'd like to do today is to look at God as he has made himself known. And there's, there's a lot more about God than one chapter, one psalm from the scriptures. But this is a pretty good place to start. And it covers a lot of territory. And part of it's because of when it was written. The 90th psalm may be the oldest piece of written literature in the Bible uh, besides the book of Job. Uh, Job seems to have already been, biblical scholar folks believe, it already been in circulation in written form uh, before the time of Moses. Now Moses, he's going to record Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. He's going to get all that written down, codified, published, available in the details. But we believe Moses, who's credited with the 90th Psalm, he wrote this somewhere between Egypt and the Promised Land. And this is written down, uh, available, even before he wrote down the books of the law, those first five books of your Bible. So this is old, ancient, and critical to determining who God is. The difference between what other people say about God, how people redefine God, and who God says he is, the one true God, Lord of heaven, and earth. This is a big one. For a big one, I'm going to ask you to stand up while I read this. Let's stand. As we read from the Word of God, and I'm going to read the whole chapter, Psalm 90. From Moses, the man of God. What a great way to be remembered in God's Word. Lord, you've been our refuge in every generation. Before the mountains were born, you gave birth to the earth and the world from eternity to eternity. You are God. You return mankind to the dust, saying, Return, descendants of Adam. For in your sight a thousand years are like yesterday that passes by, like a few hours of the night. You end their lives. They sleep. They're like grass that grows in the morning. In the morning it sprouts and grows, and by evening it withers and dries up. For we are consumed by your anger. We are terrified by your wrath. You've set our iniquities before you, our secret sins, in the light of your presence. For all our days ebb away under your wrath, we end our years like a sigh. Our lives last 70 years, or for strong 80 years. Even the best of them are struggle and sorrow. 
Indeed, they pass away quickly and we fly away. Who understands the power of your anger? Your wrath matches the fear that is due you. Teach us to number our days carefully so that we may develop wisdom in our hearts. Lord, how long? Turn and have compassion on your servants. Satisfy us in the morning with your faithful love so that we may shout with joy and be glad all our days. Let us rejoice for as many days as you have humbled us, for as many years as we've seen adversity. Let your work be seen by your servants and your splendor by their children. Let the favor of the Lord our God be on us. Establish for us the work of your hands. Establish the work of our hands. God bless the reading of his word. Please be seated. The way I'd like to do this, taking images from this chapter, is uh, this is the beginning and end of all things theology, the doctrine of God, but it'll get us a pretty good start. And it's a little bit of who we are and who God is, and we need to clarify those things. So that's what we're going to do on this back and forth. Here's the first thing I want to touch on. God is eternal, and we are dust. I don't know what your sense of self-esteem is. The Bible says you're dust. From dust you came into dust you're going to return. Uh, God is timeless in his own being. He is, that's a good theological statement. Timeless in his own being. God is eternal. There was never a time when God was not. Now, as Moses declares this to honor God's eternal nature, he contrasts God's eternity, our frailty, the brief life that we live. And we just need to come to terms with that part of things. And we're going to talk about why we need to come to terms with that part of things. The psalm rolls out the message clearly. Uh, we are temporary, vapor, mist. The Bible has all these, like grass, it pops up today, gone tomorrow. And then here's God who's eternal. And, and that being so, we're so temporary. It is really important in this life that we tether our lives to the eternal one. If we're going to have hope that reaches beyond the difficulties of a broken world, we're going to have to tie, our, tie ourselves to the God who is forever and ever and ever. If we're going to have hope in this life and in the life to come. Uh, death is a dark, looming reality for us. And here's why that's such a big deal. Because we often, often, often tie everything to here and now. We are up, down, and all around based on what's happening today, what's happening in this season of my life. And, and like now, this brief life on earth is everything, and we lose the eternal perspective on God. The things that really last, the things that are really important, the things that are eternal. And when that happens, when we lose that perspective, our priorities, our values, our plans, our purposes all get focused in the wrong place in the here and now. And we see it everywhere and all the time it, it, we have lost our way when we forget we are for time and God is eternal Paul said I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened that you may know what is the hope of his calling and the wealth of his glorious inheritance in the saints what is the immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the mighty working of his strength The difficulty in this back and forth of who God is and who we are is if we don't get this right, we lack a sense of urgency about following God. And that lack of urgency will sink your battleship because we think, and I talk to people who say, I'm a believer. There's a time in my life when I surrender my life to Jesus. I put all my faith in Him as my one and only Savior. And that's awesome. Yet there's nothing to give evidence that's ever happened because we think we always have tomorrow. We've always got another day. And, and because of that, we don't have a sense of urgency about following him. We think, well, tomorrow, tomorrow, I didn't do it today, but tomorrow I'm going to, uh, well, maybe tonight I'll go to bed a little bit earlier so I can get up a little earlier tomorrow and I can spend some time with God. Tomorrow, I'm going to start getting my prayer life together. I've always intended to put together, do, just journal about what God's teaching me as I read his word. I'm going to start doing it Tomorrow. You know, I, I, I really, I need to serve the Lord. I know I ought to be serving the Lord, serving God's people and reaching out to, tomorrow I'll do that. You know, I have a, I have a close friend. I know there's no chance that he, he knows Jesus and 
But I'll, there's so much going on. I'm going to tell him about Jesus tomorrow. There's always tomorrow. I'm, I'm going to pray with my spouse tomorrow. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to stop being consumed by my social media content tomorrow. I'm going to start giving more generously tomorrow. But I'm just so tired today. It's been such a full day. And it, but tomorrow, it's going to all be easy. Tomorrow, it's going to be simple to do what God wants me to do, to surrender my life to Him. So I'm going to wait until tomorrow. And the promise of tomorrow becomes this quietly whispered deception. And we comfortably and knowingly choose to believe it. And the truth is, our lives are not defined by our good intentions. Our lives aren't defined by the clever, wonderful acts of obedience we intend to do tomorrow. Our lives are defined by the reality of what we choose today. The simple, biblical, one step at a time choices we make today. We fool ourselves and think because we desire to change, we desire to grow, that we're doing what's right. True desire is when you're not overwhelmed by wanting to do good. You want it so badly that you actually choose to do what is right before God. God is eternal. We are dust. The second thing, and that's the, that's the long one. The rest of them are going to flow out of that. He's the creator. We're his creatures. We are the created. He's the creator. God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He made them male, created them male and female. The timeless one, God, is our creator. We are his creatures. Another image that comes up in the scriptures, he's the potter. He takes, we're the clay. He, he makes us, molds us, creates us the way he wants us to be. And here's why that's a big deal. Because nobody knows better than God why you were created. Nobody knows better than the creator why you exist, why you take breath today. Now, we come up with all our own plans. Well, I think this is what I'm going to do with my life, this, 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 this. But we never do talk to God about it. Or well, how am I going to spend my day? Well, I got this plan, this plan, this plan, this plan. We haven't asked God, God, what do you want me to do today? Here are the reins of my life. I'm surrendering today to you. Uh, the reason we, we don't live for God day to day is because we forget he created us for his purpose, not for whatever we want that we're going to ask him to bless. And... As a result, we have people just floundering through life, wondering, why doesn't God answer my prayers to bless me? I, I'm, I'm doing this that I think is a good thing. Why doesn't he bless it? Because it's not what he created you to do. And no one knows better than the creator why you were created. And we need to live it for him, get to know him. And the better you know him, the better you'll know why you're here. And he makes it so clear in so many different purposes for your life. We are sinners, third. He is our Savior. Moses talks about this way. He says, iniquities, secret sins. Oh, and he just brings them out into the light. We are trapped in sin, lost in sin. We live under the curse, the penalty, the power of sin. Separated from God by our sin. But God is our Redeemer. And he comes to save us. Jesus came the sinless son of God to save us from our sins and all the garbage that comes with them. He wants to set you free from that. Our lives are lived waiting for the day. And this is a lot of anticipation in the 90th. Waiting for the day when Jesus is going to come back, when the Lord is going to come and make everything right, when he brings to completion his great plan for the world. We wait with confidence and hope. doesn't mean everything's great right now. But we wait with confidence and hope that he is great. And he'll make things right. The first verse of the 8th chapter of Romans. There's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Man, that's good news. It's a good word. And for those who have given their lives to Christ, it's a word for you. We can't bring any good works to the table that are going to save us. God's done it all. And yet we're waiting as a redeemed people. Still living in a broken world but seeking to bring glory to him in the brokenness of this world. It's such good news. Jesus from the cross said it is finished. It's all paid. It's all done. It's all accomplished. And 
We don't have to live to try to appease God to do enough religious stuff or enough good works to make him happy with us. We are saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. And saved not for just, well, I'm going to heaven when I die. Now I'm going about my business, but saved to please him, to live for him, to display his glory in our weakness. Listen, on this thing of sin, we just forget how sinful sin is. We forget how lost, lost is. Condemned and, and headed to hell for eternity is lost. And it's ugly. And it's dark. And what sin does in a life and what sin does in our world and how it reverberates out, causing devastation, even the, the slightest sin. Cosmic treason against God. And what happens is when we live comfortably with it, when we seek to just embrace our sin, because, well, God's going to forgive me for it, so... As uh, Paul makes fun of people, let's sin all the more that grace may abound. Hey, it's all about grace, so God will just lavish it on me. I'm going to win. I'm winning, winning, winning even bigger now because I keep on sinning, sinning, sinning. Knowingly, openly, or in the secret things, God sees. And we are adrift spiritually when we forget how sinful sin is and how broken uh, we are without Christ. The fourth thing is that he's our father and we're his children. Paul wrote about it this way. You did not receive a spirit of slavery to fall back into fear. Instead, you received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry out, Abba, Father. The spirit himself testifies together with our spirit that we're God's children. And if children, heirs, heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ, if indeed we suffer with him so that we may also be glorified with him. By faith in Jesus Christ, who died on the cross to pay for our sins and was raised from the dead, we can become children of God. And there are all these, all these amazing things that come with that. Jesus said, no, when you made that commitment, no one, not Satan, not anybody, is going to snatch you out of his hand. The Spirit lives inside us to remind us of our standing as his children. The Spirit, a, the Bible, a down payment. A reminder when the Holy Spirit's in your, in your life that Jesus is your Savior. He says, you know, if earthly fathers, as messed up as we can be, as failing and faulting as we can be as earthly fathers, if earthly fathers know how to give a good gift, don't you think God as Father is going to be good at giving good gifts to His children? He's a Father who will never leave us or forsake us. He's never going to be absent or disinterested. He's also going to be faithful in something else because a good father's not going to let the children do whatever they want to do. He's going to discipline his children. And God brings discipline into our lives because he loves us, the Bible says. Sometimes uh, the things that are difficult in our lives are because we just happen to live in a broken world. And sometimes the things that are difficult in our lives are because God is doing course correction in us through the circumstances of our lives to bring us back to himself. The Bible says we have been adopted into his family. He has chosen us for his family. We no longer have anything ultimately to fear because we belong to God. Next thing, number five, he is our shepherd and we are his sheep. Now, I've told you before, having raised a couple of sheep uh, with my daughter while she was doing the FFA project, sheeps are dumb animals. And I want you to be sure you see the contrast. God is a gloriously wonderful shepherd. We are dumb sheep. And we need a lot of taking care of. I am the good shepherd, Jesus told us. And the good shepherd lays down his life for his sheep. Jesus is a shepherd. Lays down his life for us. The images are so full. And that's why Jesus, I think, in the, Old, both in the Old Testament as well as what Jesus teaches, leans into this image of the sheep and the shepherd. Because the shepherd takes care of his dumb sheep. Protects his dumb sheep. Cares for them. And think about the sheep. They know the shepherd's voice. And the thing about the shepherd, he knows the sheep's name. He knows your name. He knows you. And he knows the difficulties you face. And he knows exactly where you are. We also know this about the shepherd. He's such a good shepherd that even if you walk through the dangerous dark places, the valley, even of the shadow of death, you do not need to be afraid because he walks in dark, scary places with you. And he promises to provide and protect and care. And he leads and we follow. Because he's a good shepherd. We are weak and he is strong. Uh, yes, Jesus loves me. That's a, 
I love that line because it comes from that sweet, sweet song. Yes, Jesus loves me. The Bible tells me so. And we are weak, but he is strong. Paul wrote about his relationship to God and his own physical and spiritual struggles. And this is him. Physical struggles often come with spiritual struggles. Paul said, he, he said to me, the Lord said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is perfected in weakness. Therefore, I will most gladly boast all the more about my weakness so that Christ's power may reside in me. The good news of the gospel is, you know, I just want to be strong. I just want to bear up. I just want, you don't have to do any of that stuff. Because he's strong. You don't have to carry the load. You, you don't have to be the producer. Because he, he is strong. His grace is sufficient. And one of the things about our weaknesses, his power has the greatest opportunity to shine through when we are weak. And we're looking to him, and he gets the glory. And really, that's the object of this whole thing, to shine the light on him. Not to say, hey, look what a great guy I am. Look how well I handled this pressure, this stress, this difficulty, this obstacle. To say, I couldn't do that. Paul with his thorn in the flesh, I couldn't overcome it. I couldn't beat it. God didn't take it away from me. And yet, God's grace was sufficient. God was glorified through the weakness in Paul's own life. Those are just a few things that define the relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ. We're created, redeemed, adopted, cared for, helped. All this by an eternally glorious God who loves us. We get to the eternal help and joy and God does that for us and God gets the eternal glory and all that that because he deserves it through Jesus Christ. I want to encourage you, if you know Jesus, rest in the relationship with God and be encouraged. God is near. Your relationship with him, once that relationship is established, is secure. Guys, you can come on up. I'm going to help me with something here in just a second. We're called to surrender our lives to him. That's, that's this whole thing. When God is God and we are not God, we are called to surrender our lives to him. And that's where it breaks down. A lot of people, we talked about this last week. No Jesus in my head. No surrender in my heart. I'm still living my own plan. God's not God in my life. I have a scaled down version, a manageable, uh, self-defined version of God. I'm still maintaining control. I'm still seeking to call them my own shots, to find God in our relationship in whatever way I want. Instead of the way that he's spelled out, this is who I am. This is how you need to relate to me. It was true throughout the disobedient times of God's people that they just did it the way they wanted to do it and they were lost forever because of it. The, the difficulty with surrender is we think, oh, but what's he going to ask me to do? What am I going to have to give up that I really love? What am I going to have to put aside that is just at the core of what's important to me? I just want to reassure you that life with the God of this book is far outweighed by the benefits of surrender. He is Lord. I've been pulling some things out of my prayer journal for you the last few months and this uh, didn't even have a name with it when I found it years ago. It's, uh, it's just a story about God, who God is. And I, I just want to share it with you because it means a lot to me. And when I need to write the ship, when I need to just remember, I don't know, okay, this, this makes me small and makes God big, which is what worship is, uh, it's helpful. Here's... Here's what I want to share. He is the first and the last. He's the beginning and the end. He's the keeper of creation and the creator of all. He's the architect of the universe, the manager of all time. He always was, always is, always will be. He's unmoved, unchanged, undefeated, never undone. He was bruised and brought healing. He was pierced and eased pain. He was persecuted and brought freedom. He was dead and brought life. He's risen 
and brings power. He reigns and brings peace. The world can't understand him, but armies can't defeat him. The schools can't explain him. The leaders can't ignore him. Herod couldn't kill him. The Pharisees couldn't confuse him. The people couldn't hold him. He is light and love, longevity and Lord. He's goodness and kindness and gentleness. He is God. He's holy, righteous, mighty, powerful. He's pure. His ways are right. His word is eternal. His will is unchanging. And his mind is on me. He's my redeemer. He's my savior. He's my guide. He's my peace. He's my joy. He's my comfort. He's my Lord. He rules my life. I serve him because his bond is love. His burden is light. And the goal for me is abundant life. I follow him because he's the wisdom of the wise and the power of the powerful, the ancient of days, the ruler of rulers, the leader of leaders, the overseer of the overcomers, and the sovereign Lord of all that was and is and is to come. He desires relationship with me. He'll never leave me. He'll never forsake me. He'll never mislead me, never forget me, never overlook me. When I fall, he lifts me up. And when I fail, he forgives. And when I'm weak, he is strong. And when I'm lost, he's the way. When I'm afraid, he's my courage. When I stumble, he steadies me. When I'm hurt, he heals me. When I'm broken, he mends me. When I'm blind, he, he leads me. And when I'm hungry, he feeds me. When I face trials, he is with me. When I face persecution, he, he shields me. When I face problems, he comforts me. When I face loss, he provides for me. When I face death, he carries me home. He is everything for everybody, everywhere, every time, in every way. He is God. He is faithful. I am his and he is mine. He said that. God is in control. And that means all is well with my soul. Every day is a blessing because God is.